Good morning. This is the uh, Cal EVIP uh, implementation workshop. We are going to start the workshop in about five minutes. So just wanted to make sure everyone's in the right spot. This is the uh, Cal EVIP implementation workshop. We're just waiting for everyone to gather. We're going to get started in two minutes. This is the one minute warning. We're just, uh, I hope everyone uh, understands this is the Cal EVP 
uh, implementation workshop. We're going to get started in one minute. Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Peter Caldwell from the Center of Sustainable Energy. Um, we are going to start the Cal EVIP implementation workshop. And if, Jane, if you could click to the next slide, please. As mentioned, I'm Peter Caldwell. I'm from the Center of Sustainable Energy. I'm going to be joined today by Brian Fobble with the CEC, as well as Andy Hodgson from C uh, CSD as well. Before we kick it off, next slide, please. Um, we are going to be muted throughout the program, and uh, we would ask you just to submit your questions in the chat box on GoToMeeting. Um, if there are any issues, please contact us at calvip at energycenter.org. And with that, I'm going to review the agenda topics that we're going to cover today. Jane, next slide, please. We've got six topics that we're going to cover today. We're going to give a little bit of a background of the past nine projects and the funding for the, the projects. We're going to then transition over to the uh, changes that are being made in the Sacramento uh, County project, um, followed by the next four projects and the funding amounts. Um, then we will review design changes. We will then transition over to Andy, who will talk about the uh, EVI, EVI uh, training program and the requirements. Uh, we will then go through the site connector implementation and we'll end the session with a questions and answer session for all. So with that, I will transition it to Brian. Good morning, everyone. Uh, next slide, please. So before we get started, I know we're all remote, but um, if you've visited or attended our workshops before, I'd like to always do a little warm up here and just start the Cali VIP chant. If it's new to you, uh, feel free to listen in and then join later, but it always, you know, nice to hear it. And you can use it hopefully at the end of the year when we're at some other workshops in person, but Cali VIP, Cali VIP. So, I know it's really catchy and feel free to use it whenever you're just thinking about Cali VIP or at some other workshops and want to spread the good news of Cali VIP. <laughs> so let's get into it. So to date, we have launched nine projects um, covering roughly 17 counties, I believe, and almost $160 million in rebates. That 159.18 includes partner funds from 11 different partnerships and includes multiple years of fiscal contributions. Next slide, please. This slide is showing some of the success of Cal EVIP through February of this year. Our total rebates of paid and installed, this means these are actually chargers that have completely finished and are operational. $14.5 million in rebates for 191 sites installing 534 level two connectors and 206 fast chargers. And currently reserved means our applications and installations that are have funds reserved already and are in process of completing their installations for an additional almost $84.5 million, another 638 sites, four, over 4,000 level two connectors and over 1,000 DC fast chargers. Next slide, please. We also wanted to show 
the popularity of Cali VIP by this slide will show the oversubscriptions again through February. So on top of our 159 um, million dollars, this shows that our projects for fast chargers are oversubscribed by an additional 231 million dollars, and our level twos are oversubscribed by 37 and a half roughly. Um, million dollars. It also shows that there are three projects with still some funding available. And we can get into that on the next slide, please. So where do we still have funding available? Um, if you want to go out today and apply for it, um, here's kind of your breakdown. You can see it is mainly almost 99.9% .9 for level two chargers, but for the fast chargers in the Central Coast Incentive Project, San Benito has $85,000 still available, which is roughly enough for one fast charger um, on in that county. Our level twos, we still have a large portion available for level two in the Sacramento County Project. We have some funds available in Humboldt and Shasta. We have good amounts still in Monterey and Santa Cruz, a little bit in San Benito. And then we still have some good amounts in Kern and San Joaquin Valley. I also note that the Central Coast project does have um, additional two additional fiscal years from our partner of contributions, um, another million dollars each. So those will be added, and um, the the breakdown by technology is still being decided. Next slide, please. So since the Sacramento County project still does have quite um, a good amount of level two funding available, we wanted to just talk about that, that this $3.7 million for level two funds also does not include the 1.5 million from SMUD that will be added as well. The fast charger silo is currently oversubscribed by about $2.8 million. So Cali VIP has a proposal that we um, are sharing today that is supported both by all three partners, CSC, CEC, and SMUD, to shift uh, $1.5 million of our funding from level two silo to the DC fast charging silo, which would help address some of that oversubscription of that 2.8. And so what that means is pretty much we'd be funding that wait list in Sacramento County for the fast chargers and get some installations going. Um, so ultimately, we, at, if this happens, the 3.7 would still pretty much stay, sit, stay the same because we would be adding SMUD's 1.5 million, but really shifting 1.5 million from level two to fast chargers. So we, again, fund the wait list and still have $3.7 million available for level two. And on that, we also wanted to briefly talk about project closeouts, not just for Sacramento County, but for all of our incentive projects. And I'm going to pass it on to Andy Hoskinson from the Center for Sustainable Energy to briefly talk about this. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, hello, all. So uh, the Sacramento County Incentive Project, as you saw in an earlier slide, is the third project launched under Cali VIP. Um, to date, only the first project, Fresno County Incentive Project, has begun the closeout process. We wanted to make sure that we provided um, some advance notice here that uh, the next uh, couple of projects, the Southern California Center Project um, and then the Sacramento County Center Project will begin uh, project closeout uh, this, uh, this year. And then we'll continue uh, that project closeout as, uh, as projects age. The Sacramento County Project in particular um, is about two years, uh, two years old, having launched in April of 2019. That project closeout at a high level um, will consist of um, a, a couple of stages uh, where we stop accepting new applications uh, as a first stage, um, a second stage where we would stop reserving um, funds for applications that have been filed, um, and then uh, as part of the final closeout, uh, options uh, will be discussed for any unused funds um, from, from the project. And again, um, you can look for more information on this and the close actually began on um, some of those earlier LABIP projects, including Southern California uh, and Sacramento uh, later this year in 2021.
and go to the next slide. And we wanted to, uh, as a public workshop, we wanted to make sure we gathered some information on some of the proposed, um, the, the proposals you've heard about so far. Um, uh, as you heard at the top, we have a, a full lengthy uh, question and answer uh, session at the very end where we can cover uh, questions on any topics, um, but we'll periodically um, break for uh, possible questions. And here, uh, with what we've covered, um, we'd like to solicit any uh, feedback or input on the proposed shift of one and a half million dollars of CEC's funds from level two to address the $2.8 million oversubscription of DC fast charging. Um, and then we uh, welcome again any comments or questions on the Cali BAP uh, project uh, closeout uh, planning that will uh, begin to affect the Southern California and the Sacramento projects uh, later this year. And this is the time if you uh, would like to submit any questions in the, uh, the chat box, uh, we would appreciate any feedback or questions. We have one question. Uh, great idea to shift funds from L2 to DC fast chargers in Sacramento County. When would that take an effect? Brian, can you uh, take that, please? Sure. Yeah, so um, at the end of this workshop, you'll see our docketed comment period um, will go through March 19th, um, a week from Friday. So once we have our docketed comments, closed and done, we'll meet internally to just make sure that um, the process or the proposal still sounds good and we want to move forward with it. Timing, um, you know, once we have a decision, I would really have to defer to Andy and the CSE team to see how quickly that can happen. But, um, you know, we'd be moving on it as quickly as possible after uh, March 19th. And I'll add, um, Brian, just to, to that, um, we are uh, looking at this in the latter um, parts of uh, 2021 for um, uh, uh, for, for the, the project closeout. Another question is, would you shift the funding change, uh, sorry, would you shift in funding change the policies on smudge retention of the LC fast charger? Right now, um, that requirement is not one of our proposed changes. So again, the LCFS is just for the level twos and I believe the fast charger does not have that requirement. Is there a waiting list? Sorry, next question. Is there a waiting list project in the uh, SF DC fast charger list? Are you going to process these or how much funding is left afterwards? I'm sorry, was it SF processing? Can you, can you repeat the question? I don't know if it was for Sacramento or something uh, else. I'm sorry, that is uh, not SF, it's SC. Sure. Yeah, so um, yeah, the oversubscription right now, again, I believe was uh, two point. 8 million as of end of February. And so the uh, project for Sacramento County fast chargers does have kind of the applications as they come in on that first come first serve basis. And so our initial funds went through and down that list for eligible applications. And we have a continued list that um, we always kept open for the last two years. And so as you submitted, um, you would just fall into line of previously submitted. So the one and a half million would go down the list of that's currently um, pending or just in line. People are still welcome to submit more applications any day they want as people ahead of you may be not interested um, anymore being two years later, or we also don't know how many applications that would fund again, because we would have to look at um, how many were requested for each. And so, um, 
it, you know, we'll have one, one and a half million dollars available um, to fund down that existing list and people are still welcome to continue applying. Next question is how or, or would this shift affect projects where the work has already started? They would not. So again, we're only pulling the unused funds so far that are currently available that is not reserved to any application. And so that 3.7 million that is not attributed to any application, we're proposing to shift one and a half million of unused funds um, to fund the wait list. So it would not affect any existing projects. And Peter, if we maybe have one more, um, we could take one more before moving on. There's a lot of comments, just looking for questions. Uh, would there be a shift in funding change, uh, the policy? We've answered that one, I'm sorry. What are the amounts available L2? Will they stay the same? Yes, again, so we're proposing to shift uh, one and a half million, but also we'll be adding SMUDs, uh, one and a half million that is currently not included in that 3.7. So ultimately all um, the website and stakeholders will see is the 3.7 staying the same and an additional one and a half million becoming um, available for fast chargers. Great, and I would remind everyone we have a longer uh, question and answer period at the end. So maybe what we could do now is transition to the next section. Great, so next slide please. So from the past, let's move to the future. Um, we've previously announced for our next four projects, incentive projects under Cali VIP. Um, in September, we also sent out a email in December, and now we'd like to just share some additional information on our chargers, or our, not our chargers, our incentive projects. Again, this will not be kind of the full detail of requirements and everything, but just some additional information that hadn't been available in the past. So. Um, our next project's kind of in order, the Inland Counties doing 13 counties with $17.5 million. We have a launch date tentatively scheduled for that as May 12th, 2021, followed by our South Central Coast project for San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura, Q3 2021, 7.1 mil, 7 mil, Alameda County in Q4 with 14, I'm sorry, that should be 14 and a half, I believe. Um, no, oh, 14, you're right. And Southern California level two, going back to our previous four counties, Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, which only had DC fast charges available and roughly $22 million. We can go to the next slide, please. So some of the information we can share is one, the landing page is now live for the Inland Counties Incentive Project as of yesterday. Um, so you can go on that landing page to get the full implementation manual of all the requirements. And um, this slide here will also be available to show what the funding breakdowns by technology and county includes. The percentages next to each dollar amount in each county just shows um, how those amounts were chosen. Again, if you've listened to our previous um, projects and workshops that we use the CEC and NREL's EVI Pro analysis for determining um, funding amounts. And we usually try to address um, a gap of 50% for level two and 30% for fast chargers. You can see that there are um, five counties that have an asterisk that go slightly above the 30 and 50 to roughly 70, I'm sorry, 50 and 30, up to roughly 70 and 50 addressing gaps. And that's because those five counties 
have over 50% of their population living in DAC and or low incomes, and we've decided to bump those up um, for equity reasons. And again, these are using EVI Pro 1 for our gap analysis. Um, for this project, I also wanted to highlight some quick changes that, you, again, you can see in the landing page that uh, one change is we are allowing eligible expenses to be incurred at the applicant's own risk from the launch date of the landing page, which was yesterday, March 10th, 2021. So previously, costs, only planning, design, and engineering costs could be incurred um, once the landing page was live but no um, you know, equipment purchases or actual construction could begin until your funds were reserved. We are making that change that you, at your own risk, again, can start incurring any cost that is eligible under Cali VIP as of yesterday. And again, this is at your own risk because we cannot guarantee your application will, one, be eligible or received um, a reserved rebate. <clears throat> Um, one other change is that our combo applications um, usually allow the full amount of level twos and fast chargers to be uh, eligible for rebates, but we are changing all of our 2021 projects to change the amount of level two connectors down to only four connectors. So this means on a combo application, you can apply for the max of, uh, I believe this one's four DC fast chargers and you could add on an additional four level two connectors. You're still welcome to install over that, but the rebate calculation will only include four eligible connectors. And again, all this information in full detail is on the landing page inside the implementation manual. Next slide, please. So following, um, the Inland Counties, again, is our South Central Coast, and so the funding breakdown of our 7.1 million is shown here for the three counties, again, using EVI Pro 1 for the gap analysis, and we're proposed funding the 50% and 30% uh, level two and fast charger amounts there. This project also has partnerships that are being finalized, um, so we're not ready to share anything beyond that other than we have partnerships in the work that hopefully will get finalized and include additional funding that will go above and beyond um, the CEC's contributions shown here. Next slide, please. So here the um, Alameda County project. Um, I will want to later verify that these numbers are correct, but um, we are again using EVI Pro 1, and you can see here the levels are slightly different than our 50 and 30 percent. Um, this is because, again, we do have a proposed um, project partner here and that we're still finalized, and our local partner has expressed the interest of having a higher percentage of the fast chargers being addressed over the level twos because of the region's high and dense MUD populations here and the fast chargers as a possible solution of um, better access to charging. So we've proposed, uh, we've actually agreed to these funding amounts and um, the partnership again will be above and beyond um, these levels and to be finalized at another point. Next slide, please. So, for our fourth project launching in Q1 2022, the Southern California Level 2 project, um, we're not ready yet to propose our funding breakdowns. Um, again, we've typically used EVI Pro 1, but with a multiple, uh, multiple executive orders coming out that's kind of changing California's um, goals for EVs and ZEVs in the future, uh, the CEC and NREL have been developing EVI Pro 2 to address the higher need, and EVI Pro 2 will be available in the spring of this year, and we would like to use the new EVI Pro 2 numbers to help with our gap analysis. Um, we also wanted to take more consideration of the other existing projects or programs that have 
launched or got approvals since we initially started designing this project, including the Charge Ready 2 from um, Edison that was approved in August of last year and LADWP's um, investments and their goals of deploying or having roughly uh, 25,000 commercial chargers by 2025. So we're gonna take a little bit more time on this, but we will uh, provide another opportunity for stakeholder review and comments at a future date once we have the additional analysis and proposals ready. Next slide, please. So here again, after um, kind of all of our segmented topics, we'll take a little bit of time to answer questions on these, but again, we'll have the larger sections. So of the funding breakdowns by technologies here, we can stop and pause a little bit to take any questions on those uh, funding amounts. And just quickly, Brian, um, there's a question here. Could you explain the decision making behind reducing the number of L2 L joules for the combo application? Sure. So the decision there is that, again, our fast charger sites um, have different eligibility over our level two. And our fast charger sites are typically sites that someone's going to spend a shorter time at. Um, they're on their regular travel routes for their daily commutes and are, you know, sites that you're really only looking to maybe stop real quick, have a bite to eat, go in and grab some groceries and get out. And so um, our fast charger sites, we have typically seen everyone um, taking the max amount and we um, not necessarily every time the fast charger site is the best site for a level two. And so we still want to offer sites to have um, level two as a backup as well for uh, vehicles that don't have the dc charging port but um, we want to really get level two uh, chargers at the site type that fits their use case the best and so we're still going to offer it but limit it to four connectors Next question, Brian, is uh, as it relates to uh, Alameda, can you please explain the rationale behind the view of that DC fast chargers offers better access in areas of dense MUDs? So MUDs um, are a very difficult nut to crack. Uh, we are trying to find different solutions by trying to have um, you know higher rebate levels um, adders for MUDs for the level two and we're trying to have different options but the fast chargers you know located around um, in hubs maybe around the MUDs are one option but again this came from our partner with a request um, and we are working with them we believe it's also a good idea to kind of have these hubs as MUDs, you know, haven't been the most um, heavy participating site type yet in Cali VIP. And so uh, we still welcome sol different solutions um, through the comments of how to address MUDs. But at this time, um, through our partnership negotiations and communications, this is the avenue we are pursuing. Um, but as always, welcome comments on how to crack that MUD nut. This is a question for Andy. What is the expected turnaround time to hear back on applications um, given the oversubscribe rate? Andy, can you address that? Sure, if we're talking um, about uh, existing or past projects, um, uh, for example, Sacramento that was discussed earlier, once there's a shift of funds, um, they'll begin uh, outreach to applicants in that oversubscribed or wait list uh, pool. Um, if, uh, as, as Brian has noted, there's not been, um, beyond the Sacramento project, any proposed funding uh, to any other existing projects to address uh, the, the oversubscription list. So until such time, we would not be able to um, uh, reach out uh, programmatically, but rather we would reach out uh, incrementally if we had certain applications cancel, and then we would move uh, uh, to uh, the wait list for the next application in line. 
Next question is, is there any potential funding partners for the Inland County? And Andy, do you want to take that? Yeah, there are no uh, proposed funding partners for the Inland Counties and Center project as of now. And there's a number of topics that are going to be covered later in the agenda. So if we can, uh, I will hold these questions for the end of the day if we want to transition to the next slide. Great. So our next topic here is our design changes that we presented in um, September and again sent out an email in December to kind of announce the decisions on what we proposed originally. So the first one is around our rebates and I'll just highlight um, the changes here again which we previously workshopped that our level two base rebate um, we are decreasing by a thousand dollars to 3,500 up to 3,500 per connector or up to 75 percent of the total project cost whichever is less. Um, again, this is because all of our recent projects are um, greatly being oversubscribed for both fast chargers and level twos, and we are trying to maximize public dollars for additional um, chargers installed, as well as, um, you know, we're trying to have good projects ready to go that um, will not just be trying to do a money grab for a large amount. Our DAC low income, DAC, sorry, disadvantaged community and low income community adder is not changing at $500. And we have increased our MUD adder an additional $1,000, again, because we know MUDs are difficult and we're still trying to provide the same amount um, as our past projects. Our rebates for our 50 kW to 99.9 kW charger are um, changing as well. And I guess this should technically change a little bit where um, we'll discuss later, but the $30,000 per connector, active connector, we should say, um, is the new rebate level, which is a $20,000 decrease. And that also decrease stays the same for the DAC LIC, where it'll be 40,000 per active connector or up to 75% of the costs. Our fast charger, our high power fast charger, which is over 100 kW, um, we were not changing, we originally proposed not to change these amounts, but the one change that hasn't previously been um, announced is the base for our 100 kW or greater. We are decreasing $10,000 to be a um, level or equal doubling of our 50 kW to 99.9. So 60,000 per active connector or up to 75% of the costs and not changing the previously 80,000 for the DAC LIC. And we'll be able to talk more about that change to active connector later on in the workshop. Next slide, please. So the other design changes that we're implementing is a voluntary invoice template um, beginning with our first 2021 project. Again, this is voluntary, but really highly recommended to be used as there has been difficulties um, with applicants being kind of knowing exactly the format they need to submit their invoices in for quick payments. And so this is aimed to try and decrease the back and forth time with um, a rebate processing specialist and the applicant and really expedite the payment once you are um, completed with your project. We're also raising the minimum that we will um, invest in disadvantaged communities and or low incomes communities. Previously it was 25%, we are bumping that to 35%. And that again is a minimum where we can and think it's justified to go higher, we can still increase this amount um, in different projects. Um, I previously mentioned that the eligible costs um, can be incurred now, starting with a uh, landing page being launched for any of our next four projects. And so, again, 
the inland counties launched yesterday, so projects can begin incurring eligible costs as of yesterday. But for the next project, South Central Coast, that is not allowed until that landing page goes live um, roughly two months before a project uh, launches. So please don't start any work yet on our next three projects after inland. But as soon as you see that landing page goes live, you at your own risk, again, own risk, can incur costs if you so desire. And then again, the limit for the level two connectors on combo applications is being lowered to four connectors. Next slide, please. And these are just quick highlights, but um, you'll hear more later on. But again, EVITP, the electric vehicle uh, training program is going to be a requirement for any application that moves into a reserve status on or after September 1st of this year. This will be in effect for our San Diego incentive project and our uh, and beyond. So also our Peninsula Silicon Valley, Inland Counties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, any project that launched before the San Diego County Incentive Project will not be required to use these if they move into, use the EVITP requirement um, if they move into a reserve status. But San Diego, Peninsula, those also have additional fiscal year contributions. And so you will be required to follow the EVITP requirements, which we'll go into detail later. Our DC fast charger connector requirement is something we also uh, proposed in the past and shared, and we are moving forward with this change. And so it will begin with the Alameda County project of this year. And it's basically changing our requirements uh, for the connectors and how we calculate rebates away from a physical charger and to an active connector. And so the requirement is that any site with the fast chargers must have at least one Chatmo connector and at least 50% of the total connectors must be CCS. And so again, the previous requirement was a charger. Every charger must have both a Chatmo and CCS connector on that charger. We are now moving away from that to say that um, again, a site must have one Chatmo connector and at least 50% of their connectors be CCS. Um, the applicant and site are welcome to do any combination they want as long as they meet these requirements. Next slide, please. And so here, we'll pause again shortly for questions just on those design changes um, that I just discussed. Just looking at one here, the installation of the 100 kilowatt chargers, six per jobs, uh, exponentially increases the utility cost. Um, this does not seem to be a reflective increase in the rebate amounts. Are there plans to increase the rebate amounts in the chargers as the chargers get larger? No, at this time we are actually going the other way as um, Again, our fast chargers have greatly been oversubscribed um, in almost every single project. And that means people are willing to take on, you know, a cost share of themselves, as well as possibly stacking with other projects. But again, um, state's role is to maximize the public's dollars to have the best benefit to um, the people. So we would like to, as long as we have interest and um, we can, we are going to try to accomplish that goal by finding the right balance of rebate level and participation. Do the MUD ports need to be public or can they be installed at, uh, at assigned deed? So again, all of the requirements for each project will be listed in that project's implementation manual. For level twos, we do allow those to be private use, 
but they must be shared use. So shared use at this time, again, means more than one vehicle person using that charger. And so if it's an MUD, it cannot be dedicated to a single um, unit or uh, resident, and it must be accessible to the uh, full staff, or not staff, the full residents on that site. So again, shared use, but can be quote unquote private where it's not open to the full public, but more of its residents. Next question is, what costs are eligible as of program launch? Uh, the slide uh, indicated all costs. Uh, would that include the chargers and the cost of installation? Yes, so again, there's too many to uh, go over right now, but again, the implementation manual for every single project, go to the landing page on the calivip.org website, find the project you're interested in, scroll down and on the right you'll see an implementation manual that will discuss the full eligible costs but yes the our rebates do have eligible costs above and beyond just the chargers the charger anything that's required for installation purposes your labor your design and engineering utility upgrades uh, your warranties your uh, maintenance plans networking agreements um, pretty much really anything that's really um, going to be required to get your installation done with the exception of the permit fee itself. But again, I just reference you to the uh, implementation manual of the project that you're interested in. Maybe I can just provide one more question. Is there any guidance on recommended hardware and software for projects? Uh, for hardware, our website has an eligible equipment PDF. So we do have uh, equipment requirements and our PDF shows all the chargers, both level two and fast chargers that are eligible for rebates under Cali VIP. So instead of having by yourself to go check your charger you're interested in and see if it meets it, uh, we have a PDF that just shows you already, these are the ones that are currently eligible. Um, so I would just follow through on uh, reviewing that document that we tried to update with new, um, as new charters become available um, each month. Great. Do you want to transition to the next section? Yeah, if we go to the next slide, I will hand off the remainder of the discussion to Andy. Thank you. Thanks again, Brian. Uh, so Brian overviewed a couple of uh, design changes or requirements uh, that are coming in. The first uh, that I wanted to go into a little more detail on the implementation of is the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Training Program, or EVITP. Um, that, as Brian noted, will begin to be implemented September 1st, 2021. Um, the uh, so it will begin about three months, though, uh, ahead of the effective date of AB 841, uh, which we codified in the Public Utilities Code. Um, the specific requirements um, that uh, there uh, it will be enforced here are that electric vehicle charging of structure and equipment that is on the customer side of a meter will need to be installed by a contract with the appropriate license classification. And critically, at least one electrician on each crew uh, who holds the EVITP certification. If the DC, if the EV charger installation includes DC fast chargers or level two chargers um, that supply 25 kilowatts or or more, then the requirement is that at least 25% of the total electricians working on the crew must hold the EVITP certification. Um, I want to highlight that um, implementing this, uh, this requirement uh, carries some risk for project applicants that if you're in a funds reserve state and uh, you work with a contractor on the installation or you are the contractor on the installation and uh, you, you perform the work uh, and don't meet this, that reserve reservation of funds will not be able to be paid out. So again, without this requirement being fully met, um, a rebate will not be able to be paid. Go ahead and give you a little bit more information on um, the EVITP implementation and what steps may be taken on the applicant side on the next slide here. 
So uh, to ensure compliance with this EBITP uh, requirement, there will be some additional uh, required documentation that will be uploaded uh, for any application um, or uh, any payment, whether it's a milestone payment or a final payment. Uh, that information uh, that will be required includes a job site installation form. That will be a new form that will be downloadable um, from the uh, in uh, the incentive project landing page. Again, this will start with the Alameda County incentive project. Um, that form will require a minimum uh, indication by the electrical contractor of the total number of electricians on the job, the number of EBITP certified electricians, the names and EBITP certification number for each of those certified electricians. Um, additionally, there'll be some uh, 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 corroborating uh, information that will be required, particularly a copy of the EBITP certificate of completion. Not necessarily required, but a proposal we appreciate any feedback on is uh, the notion of uh, requiring a copy of the driver's license for uh, any of the EBITP certified electricians on the job. And that's just proposed, and we welcome comment or input on uh, that being included as uh, one of the required uh, pieces of documentation. With the documentation provided, uh, CSE's uh, verification of EBITP will uh, include a step um, utilizing the uh, EBITP website's uh, proposed and under development uh, lookup tool. So that'll be a, a publicly uh, accessible lookup tool that EBITP is currently working on uh, and will be uh, available before the implementation on um, Cali IP begins. We've got a little information um, with this new requirement on the next slide on um, how folks can continue to get ready for uh, this new requirement. There's an upcoming workshop. We can show you the details on the next slide here. So there's a, a online um, EBITP training that will begin in uh, roughly mid-April, April 12th. Uh, that EBITP training um, is uh, approximately an 18 hour uh, training that's completed over five days, not consecutive. Um, and it carries a training cost, um, which also covers the exam of $275. Uh, and there is a required sign up for that training session by March 25th. So just a uh, couple of weeks to the day uh, from now. Um, you can go to EBITP.org. Um, or use the link in the uh, PowerPoint that will be distributed here uh, to access that for registration. We encourage everybody to uh, look into that to make sure that you're ready for the coming requirements. We can transition to the uh, next slide. And with that, we'll take, we'll pause here uh, and take any questions that anyone has on any EBITP uh, requirement or the implementation of that. Yes, Andy, there is a question for chargers already installed prior to nine, uh, September 1st. Would we get reserves after 9 1? Would EB, EBITP be acquired retroactively? That's a great question. Uh, timing question there. So um, I'm going to break this down into sort of two parts. Let's start first with the Alameda County and Center project. Um, that project, as uh, shown in a slide earlier, will launch post September 1st, um, 2021. And uh, as such, all applications that will be built um, or fulfilled under that project will require the use of EBITP labor. For the projects that launch um, prior to Alameda County and Center project, uh, that's all of um, the existing projects from San Diego County and Center project. And then uh, Silicon Valley and Center Project, Inland Counties and Center Project, and then the South Central Coast and Center Project. For applications that are approved into a funds reserve status after 9 uh, September 1st, 2021, uh, there would be a, uh, a requirement for the EBITP um, uh, labor. Great. There is a question about the driver 
license for EBITP. Uh, Andy, could you just clarify the proposal that we have on utilizing the uh, driver's license? Yes, of course. Uh, so there is a proposal in coordinating with EBITP. Um, there's a recommendation that um, we, uh, we require a copy of the driver's license for each EBITP certified electrician that is on the job um, as one more way to tie their certification uh, to that actual person and their presence on the job site. That is a current proposal and it is a copy of the driver's license for each EBITP certified electrician to be included in the full packet. Do the electricians need to be certified prior to starting the work? Yes. What are your thoughts behind developing and requiring the EBI training program? Are electricians currently uh, doing quality? So I guess the question is, what are your thoughts behind implementing the development of the program? Um, I would point um, for a, a robust sort of uh, answer on that. Um, there was a prior workshop uh, in, um, and I, Brian, if you know the details, that's great. You can please add, but I believe it was in the late summer of um, uh, 2020 uh, where we, uh, we held a significant um, focus on the EBITP requirement, hearing from uh, multiple different stakeholders on the value of um, adding that, uh, that training. And um, with, uh, with that full, full, uh, fully part of uh, the record, we, we would point you there to get a, a more comprehensive answer than we'd be able to give now. Um, but the training ensures um, a minimum of uh, uh, familiarity and uh, competency in uh, dealing with installing, siting uh, electric vehicle chargers in a um, in a safe and efficient manner. And I I just say this, Brian, again with the Energy Commission, but just add that you know more safety is always better. Um, but uh, I believe that workshop. That Andy was referencing was um, done by the Energy Commission in June. It should also, the event should be shown on um, the Energy Commission's events pages or the Cali VIP docket. And part of the legislation around EBITP that you know, is requiring the Energy Commission to use this for all of our funding um, also has a requirement that the Energy Commission will hold workshops um, this year around the content and um, for the training of EVITP and um, publicly vet, you know, is it good enough? Does it need more, et cetera? And more information on that should be coming out from the Energy Commission soon. That is a different unit than our EV infrastructure. And one maybe final question is where, uh, I think you covered this, Andy, but where can we find a schedule of these classes? What what uh, resource would you direct the audience to? Great, uh, maybe we can back up one slide uh, here, please. The um, hyperlinked um, website here will take you to the exact sign up page for the next EVITP training. Um, and then I would encourage you, if you missed that training, cannot make that, um, to bookmark the EVITP.org website. And again, this um, presentation will be uh, posted and distributed following uh, this webinar. Um, so you'll have uh, direct access through that, those materials to, to that link as well. So uh, there is a question, is EBITP a public or private organization? EBITP is a, um, a non-profit uh, uh, organization. Great, okay. I think we will capture some of the other questions later uh, at the end of this. If you want to transition to the next section. Great. The um, 
second uh, substantial design change that Brian um, uh, highlighted uh, a requirement uh, that he highlighted was the shift to a focus on um, DC fast chargers uh, at a site level with the requirement being a uh, that every site have a Chatamo connector and that the installation on that site include at least 50% of the SAE uh, combined charge system or CCS connectors. Um, as Brian started to uh, uh, describe, um, that shift to focus those requirements at the site level um, forces a fundamental shift from the current Cal EDIP uh, definition or treatment of DC fast chargers, which focuses at the equipment level, particularly at what I would call the dispenser, uh, the dispenser level. Um, the current uh, Cal EDIP projects and including those planned through South Central Coast and Center project have um, the following as their operative DC fast charger definition and requirement. That is a dual standard charger, meaning a charger that has both a CHAdeMO and SAE CCS combo uh, connectors uh, on that charger, and then that it's either capable of between 50 and 99.9 .9 kilowatt or 100 kilowatt or greater per pair of connectors. So the little graphic here shows, um, uh, functionally shows what that definition looks like. It's the dispenser with both of those connectors. A rebate is, um, attached to that configuration. The dispenser with both connectors equals one, one rebate. And that is regardless of whether or not that configuration uh, is providing non-concurrent or concurrent charging at the connectors. So by that we mean uh, if it's non-concurrent, then uh, vehicle one plugging into connector one uh, arriving there first would, would get a charge while immediately after vehicle two uh, connecting would have to wait for um, a sequential charge um, uh, when vehicle one's uh, charge is complete. That is uh, the non-concurrent um, configuration. Concurrent charging would be um, a dispenser with, again, two connectors, but where they could uh, output uh, power simultaneously to both connectors. With this shift in focus to the site uh, level requirements, uh, starting with the Alameda County Incentive Project, and this requirement will not reach back to any of the past projects, the definition for a DC fast charger will change, as Brian uh, noted. Uh, it will, the new definition will align uh, more fully with the uh, definition of DC fast charger that is used in EBI Pro 1. Specifically, that definition is a CHATMO or SAE CCS connector that can serve a vehicle at or above the minimum rebated power capacity without any operational limitations. Um, that means a um, if, if it was uh, to be rebated at the 50 to 99 kilowatt, that if a vehicle pulls up and connects to that CCS or that CHATMO connector, there is not a reason that they could not get that 50 kilowatt uh, power delivery if the vehicle was able to take it required uh, that, that uh, a degree of power transfer. Um, the rebate will be tied no longer to a pair of connectors, a dispenser with a pair of connectors, but rather to each of these, um, uh, e each of these CHATMO or CCS connectors uh, that, again, that can serve the vehicle um, without any operational limitations. I want to note that for compliance with the um, CHATMO uh, and 50% uh, CCS requirement, that non-concurrent charging configurations uh, can still meet that as long as the non-concurrent ratio does not exceed two connectors this is shown down there below, uh, for every one that is able to uh, output uh, uh, power. We'll go into some examples to help um, uh, explain this a little bit more on the next slide. 
So first, um, just to, to illustrate our current Cali VIP projects, again, through South Central Coast, this definition and this interpretation uh, will uh, be operative and remain operative. Um, that is, if you have a dispenser or a configuration with a pair, um, a Chatamo and a CCS connector, you would receive one rebate, regardless of whether or not both of those connectors could simultaneously charge or would charge in a sequential manner. If you had two of those, you'd receive two rebates and so on and so forth, up to the maximum number of rebates eligible under the project. With the Alameda County Incentive Project or later projects, um, the shift uh, looks a little different. If you were to uh, construct two CCS, three CCS, four CCS, and no Chatham on a site, there would be no rebate because of the single, uh, the provision of at least one Chatham on a site would not be met. If you were to provide just a single Chatamo connector or multiple Chatamo connector connectors, um, uh, but no uh, CCS, um, you would uh, not receive a rebate until you provide CCS in a ratio that is uh, at least 50% of those uh, connectors on site or CCS. Um, as we shift to a single rebate and look at that for the um, for for uh, the Alameda County Incentive Project, if your configuration included both a CCS and a Chatamo connector uh, in such a manner where they did not provide concurrent charging, uh, but had to charge uh, sequentially, as shown here, we've uh, grayed out uh, the CCS connector to sort of illustrate that, um, you would meet the single Chatamo on site and the 50% CCS, and you would have one um, uh, connector at a time that could provide that um, unconstrained uh, power delivery. Therefore, you receive one rebate. A couple, but not exhaustive, examples of uh, receiving two rebates would be if you were to uh, provide a um, DC fast charging with a CCS and a Chatmo connector in a configuration where they were both able to charge concurrently. Again, you'd meet the single Chatmo and the 50% CCS requirements and each connector would be able to deliver that unconstrained uh, power to the vehicle, therefore you'd receive two rebates. Um, similarly, if you were to uh, install two uh, Chatamo uh, connectors and a CCS, um, you would not receive three rebates, but rather two because uh, you would only achieve the 50% CCS requirement um, on, uh, on two rebates uh, in that uh, proposed configuration. And then um, the examples for the three, four, re and four rebates, be five or six, depending on the project and the maximum number of rebates that are eligible, um, are examples where the CCS 50% requirement and the single Chatmo requirement um, are met. Um, as Brian has noted earlier, um, these are uh, a type of rebates that you would receive. Um, but under Cali BIP projects, you can build in excess of the rebates that are um, eligible. We'll go ahead and go into a little more detail on um, how some of this will uh, work in the Alameda County Incentive Project on the next slide. So uh, as Brian had mentioned earlier in response to a question, we maintain and will continue to maintain an eligible equipment PDF for the current uh, Cali VIP projects up through uh, South Central Coast, but we'll also develop and provide a new eligible equipment PDF um, that's captured, that will be created to capture the DC fast charge equipment um, uh, as, it, uh, as it would uh, be rebatable under the new definition as we've just gone through. Um, all of the Cali VIP applications are filed online for those of you that are not familiar with it. And for those of you uh, that are, one of the very first steps is the selection of um, equipment. That portion of the application, online application, will be modified to require both the selection and the number of Chatamo and or CCS connectors on DC fast charger dispensers that are capable of variable configurations. As we receive documentation 
um, uh, on the uh, projects from the, the project applicants. We'll conduct a review of those equipment invoices to ensure that there's match with the selected uh, and or eligible equipment. And then the, the ratio of non-concurrent um, DC fast charger connectors um, uh, is uh, maintained that a single Shadamo and the CCS counter proportions of 50% or greater are, um, are all met. With that, we can uh, transition to specific uh, questions on the DC fast charger site uh, connector um, requ new requirement, new definition, and implementation. Just waiting for any questions to arise on the site connector. Don't see anything, let's give it a couple of minutes. For installation, do you have do you have to have used prevailing wages or union workers? Uh, across all Cal VIP projects, um, the uh, requirement for prevailing wage uh, is uh, is present. As a reminder, this uh, audio program will actually be available at the end of the presentation, uh, as well as the material. Great. Just as a reminder, as we close the uh, the six topics, um, that if you can submit all of your questions here, we'll start reviewing them uh, in the chat box. Um, after the uh, workshop is complete, um, we will email this to the attendees. There are two ways to submit them um, through the CEC docket, the 17-EVI-01, as well as through the um, the link attached. So with that, I'm gonna go back and reopen some questions. Regarding Inland County Incentive Program, the website says there's no new, that the new construction projects aren't eligible for L2s, except for affordable MUD. Can you confirm that this is correct? Sorry, Peter, this is Andy. Is, is, was that to Brian or, or, or myself? Uh, I'm sorry, this is Andy. Oh, okay. Um, so can you repeat the, the, the question here? Yeah. Regarding Inland County and Center Project, the website says that no, that new county, sorry, the website says that new construction projects aren't eligible for L2, except for affordable MUD. Can you confirm that this is correct? Uh, I I actually don't believe that's um, that's correct. Um, what we'll do is we'll provide a, a response as part of the um, the distribution uh, from this. But I believe that under the Inland Counties and Center Project, new construction uh, is 
uh, is uh, eligible, not just for uh, uh, affordable housing, but for uh, other types of um, development. Yeah, and th this is Brian. I, I see that as well on the website right now, but um, we will <laughs> double check that. Um, new construction typically is allowed in most projects. Our Peninsula Silicon Valley is one exception there. But uh, new construction as well is you know, a difficult item as the charger must be installed and publicly accessible within our timelines. And so that means your new construction site must also be really complete and open at that time and usually takes more than our nine and 15 months. So we will double check um, this requirement on the web page and um, provide an update um, at a future date. And, and just add, we can include that update with distribution of, um, of these materials. Great, at what point in Sacramento will the first changes to closeouts take place? Uh, I, I can um, try to answer this. So uh, this is Andy. So the Sacramento County and Center project will be the second, um, well, sorry, it's the third Cali VIP project. Uh, it, its project closeout will, uh, phases will follow the Southern California and Center project phases and the first stage, which we noted to be the, um, the uh, where we'll stop accepting new applications um, will likely occur in the latter half um, of 2021. There will be significant advance notice of that, um, uh, both on the website through the use of uh, banners and through um, communication distribution to um, all Cali VIP subscribers. So if you go to calivip.org and subscribe to our um, email uh, list, we'll ensure that you get that information. Um, but that will not, um, that stage will not be entered uh, without significant uh, advanced notice going out through those means. Yeah, to add on that, um, again, this is really to say we're starting to think about um, the project closeout. So again, as Andy's alluding to, we don't have final decisions yet. Um, and we're really just announcing that, you know, no project's gonna live forever <laughs> and that um, we're gonna start developing a plan to say when and how um, projects should close out. And we definitely welcome public um, comments and input in the docket, so thank you. There's another question here and maybe Brian, I'll direct it to you. Current incentive projects are oversubscribed in a matter of minutes. Are there plans to make the incentive projects more equitable and accessible? So we have been looking around different options um, and ultimately right now there are no current plans as um, our, our plate for development and launching projects is really full, um, but we definitely are trying to find ways to make improvements um, within our current capabilities. Sorry, Brian, uh, this question for you. Do the funding changes apply to existing programs who are already included in funding over multiple fiscal years, or are the funding changes only for new Cal VIPP programs? By funding changes, um, I, I can reference I believe this is referring to the changes when you were discussing the Sacramento project. Yeah, so the funding change is solely only for the Sacramento County project of that one and a half million shift from level two to fast chargers. If you're referencing the rebate levels, um, adjusting the level two and the fast charger levels, 
that is only in effect for our next four projects, not for existing projects. Are there documents that only enforce uh, the AB 841 requirements? And, and the second part of this, will there be any field enforcement? So the first part of the question, are there documents that um, are required for uh, compliance with uh, the EBITP requirement, which is consistent with a AB 841? Um, and yes, um, we've specified on an earlier slide the documents that uh, would be required, which are a um, attestation to the use of uh, labor, a, uh, a site installation form that would be completed by the contractor of record. Um, uh, there's information that's required uh, on, on there. Uh, and then there is a... Um, uh, there, there's also a requirement for the provision of the, uh, the EBITP certificate for each um, electrician, and then there is a, a lookup that uh, CSE would perform. There's also a proposal for consideration of requiring um, a copy of the driver's license from each uh, EBITP certified electrician uh, that, is, uh, that is on uh, the job site or used on the job site. Of the second question on whether or not there is a requirement for a field verification, um, uh, sorry, field verification of uh, EBITP uh, contractors on site, um, that is uh, a possibility, um, but has not been uh, specified um, at, uh, at this time. Um, what I would, sorry, and, and to add, add to that, what I would note is that um, within the terms and conditions of all of the Cali VIP projects, um, you can find um, a requirement that allows for CEC and CSC staff um, to inspect the site at uh, maybe its various stages um, as, part of the, um, as part of the project review and oversight. Andy, this one, uh, can you discuss how compliance with AB 1236 influences project eligibility? So, um, AB 1236, which is, I believe, the permit streamlining um, statutes, um, I'm, well, Answering this, I would say the uh, those requirements um, affect um, the Cali VIP uh, incentive projects and the selection of those incentive projects um, uh, more uh, specifically than the uh, than the individual applications or installation projects that uh, the applicants complete under those. Um, they were used. Um, uh, AB 1236 compliance has been used as one of the factors in selecting some of the four projects that are um, being moved forward with in uh, 2021 and uh, into early 2022, as Brian had described earlier. Brian, for you, for projects offer uh, multiple years of funding, um, does the applicant need to reapply or is this filled through uh, a wait list? Correct. Yeah, there's you, no reapplying um, on launch day. Um, you'll get in and submit your applications um, right when we launch, and you'll be in your in line um, on the application queue. If you don't make the first cut, then we keep that queue in place, and as funds become available, we start where we stopped and continue going down that existing list. Brian, question for you. Do you know when the L2 Southern Cal program will have the same, will, will it have the same restrictions, only five L2 chargers versus 10 connectors? So we're still designing um, those projects. We're really only um, announcing all the final requirements right now for Inland, but 
Um, all of our other projects are still having design done. South Central Coast is coming next. We still have a lot more time for Southern California level two, but um, on you know the connector counts, our highest, um, our typical is 10 connectors per site. Um, in our uh, peninsula project, we did go up to 20 per site. So we have the capability to go higher and we will continue designing that um, and share more information when we are ready, hopefully um, in probably second half of this year. Will there be a template application form made available beforehand? Brian? So we do not make the application form um, public ahead of time. You can go back to previous projects to see um, kind of the normal flow, but don't use that as um, your final draft because each project may have differences there if there's partner funding and need a look up of customer eligibility, et cetera. But um, they will include a lot of the same information, but again, um, that the final application is not available until launch day. Question here, Brian, are rebates not per port, instead per charger? And if for, a level two, for level two, um, they are per connector. And so if a single EVSE has two connectors on it, um, you'll be eligible for two rebates, um, as long as they're both simultaneously charging, which almost all level twos do that. If you, it's a single EVSE with one, it's only one. So level two is by the connector um, that is active and fast chargers used to be by the charger. But now as Andy went over, we are going by the active connectors um, that are on a charger. So if you install a single charger that has a SAE and Chatamo and only one can be activated or used at a time, then that is one eligible rebate. If one charger can simultaneously use both connectors, whether it's both Chatamos, both SAE, CCS, or one of each, then the rebate will be determined by the max um, or the minimum power that that connector can simultaneously charge at. And that kind of overview is again shown in some of the slides available here. Going back to some earlier questions, current incentive projects are oversubscribed in a matter of minutes. Um, I think we actually answered this. What are the plans to make incentive projects more accessible? That was answered. Yep, we answered that one that will make changes within our current requirements or capabilities, but at this time, a full redesign of the application process is not um, on the table for our next four projects. There's a comment about uh, algebra equipment uh, when it was last updated. Uh, the algebra equipment list uh, for Inland County site, uh, October 19, more equipment has been added. When will this uh, be updated in the, uh, the site? I can quickly, the, the PDF available right now shows that it was updated February 2021. Um, and 
I believe right now there's only one additional, maybe two chargers that um, will be updated hopefully this March. Um, but again, it's updated as there are changes um, that take effect. And so um, each month, usually maybe around the second or third week of the month, we update it. Um, but it's not necessarily going to update every month if there are no changes. But right now, I think um, we are expecting some changes in our next version for March. For inland counties, was the maximum uh, L2 charger stations that you can apply for? And that's for Brian. For inland counties, was there a max L2 charger stations that you can apply for? Yeah, I believe it is 10 connectors um, per site. But again, all that information is on the landing page within the implementation manual. And I, I just added that I can confirm it's it's uh, it's 10 Brian um, if the application is solely for um, level two chargers on the site if there is a combination either a combination application which is both level two and DC uh, fast chargers filed under the same application or if there is um, a DC fast charger and a level two uh, filed for the same site the level two is capped at a lower amount of four instead of the uh, instead of the 10. Brian, uh, is there a process in process in prioritizing the project submission applications for communities of concern? So um, we have minimum investments in our projects again. So the we use the application queue again as they're submitted the, on the first come first serve, but we do have those minimum requirements um, for investment in DAC um, and and or low income. So for the Alameda, I'm sorry, for the Inland County project, again that's the 35% investment um, in all the counties for DAC and or low income. And I believe we also have a unincorporated um, minimum investment as well, which Andy, can you confirm? Um, there it is, sorry, for Placer, Solano, Stanislaus and YOLO, there's also a minimum 25% investment in unincorporated communities for those four counties. And so um, if that first come first serve queue uh, just going down doesn't hit those numbers, then there is a process to um, pass project, pass applications to make sure that we are uh, funding applications that at least achieve those uh, percentages of investments. There's a question about the subscription on San Diego, but might be best addressed is the oversubscription rate of the different projects. And Jane, I'm wondering if you could take us back to the page that, that outlines the oversubscription rates in the different projects. That would be slide seven. So again, can you repeat the question, Peter? I, I think it's um, can you can you subscribe for the San Diego County currently? Yeah. So all of our projects, um, even with these large numbers, are always open for new applications until we begin that project closeout phase um, of a project. So 
again, we always encourage to submit an application, even if we're greatly <laughs> oversubscribed, because we do have partners in a lot of these projects um, with the additional fiscal years. Some gaps might be harder to hit, um, with you know, 60 million roughly for fast chargers, but um, we never know what the future may hold if new partnerships come in as well. So um, again, we can't guarantee we'll hit you, but um, or we'll be able to fund you. But um, you know, our goal is to you know, show a demand and hopefully get some supply there to meet demand. Is CTEP for public charging a requirement for, for L2s? I can maybe take that. Peter, you said CTEP? Correct. You, um, so I'm not familiar with that acronym, but in the context of what we've been talking about, I, um, I'm i going to make the assumption to answer the question as if it was uh, EVITP, the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Training Program. And then the question was, is that a requirement for level two public chargers? or level two fleet chargers was public chargers. Public chargers. Um, so the answer would, would sort of simply be from um, the Alameda County Incentive Project uh, forward and from the San Diego County Incentive Project um, through the <clears throat> South Central Coast Incentive Project if the application is reserved on or after September 1st, 2021, then yes, it would be a requirement. And it's not just for public level two, it would be for DC fast charging, it would be for MUD, um, MUD level two a workplace, uh, it's the VITP requirement is um, for all types of, uh, all site types, all types of um, uh, charging uh, after September 1st, 2021. And I'd add that, that that's what we're doing in Cali VIP, um, but you know, the language from the legislation is that this is a requirement for all future um, energy commission investments, um, as well as, uh, I believe, ARB and CPUC. So um, it's not going to be solely Cali VIP, but, you know, a lot of funding, public funding programs. And while Peter's looking for additional questions, I just wanted to clarify that the Alameda County project is a CEC investment of $14.5 million. Um, I know one, we had two different slides showing different amounts, one showed 14, and then our technology split showed 14 and a half, and it is 14 and a half. I want to confirm that um, to the public, so thank you. I think we've hit the majority of them. We'll still wait for others here, but um, one, uh, do we know when LADWP will release the next program? Um, I'd say, I'm sorry, <laughs> we, we wouldn't be able to know that, um, but there is, um, their dashboard does show um, their investments, they usually, it looks like, I'm not going to speak for them, but just looking at the dashboard, looks like they do programs for six month periods and they show the current status of kind of their last three. And so you can go on their EV dashboard to see their funding for their last, I believe their current one actually goes now through June. And then their next one um, will be announced whenever they decide to do so. But um, I just refer you to their um, dashboard online.
Andy, there are still some questions about the DC fast charger CC. Sorry, I'm losing. Um, where can we find out more information and in, in, uh, about the DC fast charger? Uh, I've lost the question. I'm sorry. So while you're locating that, Peter, um, uh, just just uh, for, for all, again, this uh, deck with um, all, all the information will be distributed um, after this. Um, the docket, as shown on the screen, remains open for um, additional questions. Um, and then uh, Cali VIP general um, question lines um, are, are available um, uh, all, all the time if um, in reviewing these materials, maybe a little more at leisure. Uh, you continue to have questions on what I'm imagining is a DC fast charger site level connector requirement, the change in definition, starting with the and affecting the Alameda and later projects. Um, we would encourage you to, uh, to reach out uh, through any one of those mechanisms, including questions to the docket, questions to the Cali VIP uh, general uh, email line, which can be found at calivip.org. Uh, um, uh, uh, to seek uh, any additional information or clarifications that you might have. I think that was the uh, follow-up. It's just for uh, more specifically where uh, some clarity around the uh, requirements. So, yeah, and, and and the last I'll add to that is as we approach that Alameda County Incentive Project, we will hold a requirements webinar specifically for it. Um, at that time, we will go into uh, even greater detail on the um, on the DC fast charger site level requirements and how it's implemented, along with um, being able to uh, provide the eligible equipment guide uh, that is intended to support um, uh, uh, to support understanding of that and then uh, application uh, proper application. So more information will be provided in that webinar for the Alameda County and Center Project, uh, very specifically on that question. Yeah, and, and on that topic, I'll just add that um, normally what we've done for the, our last few projects is hold two workshops uh, or webinars on each project, one specifically around requirements. And then as we get closer to the launch, we hold kind of a, a marketing, more informational, hey, let's keep you interested here's what's coming soon workshop. For these next four uh, projects, we are changing to do just one webinar for each project individually. And so right now, again, the landing page is live for Inland and we announced the launch date of May 12th and we haven't released it yet, but we will be doing um, that one workshop solely on the Inland County project sometime in April. So please subscribe to all the lists um, and emails so that you can get that information um, when we have those dates finalized. But we'll follow suit with that for each project themselves. So not just the Alameda, not just Inland, but every project will have their own workshop that will just go through the requirements and process for that project. Not seeing any further questions. We'll just wait a few minutes for further questions. Question here, if a licensee can install uh, the chargers, are you asking them to be VITP certified to receive the rebate? Andy? Yes, the requirements under AB 841, which will go into effect, as Brian mentioned, for not just um, Cali VIP, but for um, public funding 
of EV charger installations from uh, California Air Resources Board, Public Utilities Commission, and the California Energy Commission. Um, those will go in effect September, or sorry, uh, January 1st, 2022. Um, and under Cali VIP, we'll be implementing those requirements starting September 1st. They do require the electricians, not the contractor, the electricians that are on site performing the work um, to be EVITB certified in the numbers or ratios that are contained in um, the slide in this deck. I think it is slide 21 um, that, uh, that notes um, uh, the, the number of at least one EVITP certified electrician um, on the site. Again, the electrician, not not the C10 contractor necessarily, could be one of the same, is not always though. Question here, Brian, how does Cal EVIP programs mesh with Edison Charge Ready 2 programs? Are they limited stacking or priorities? So we try to um, design complementary uh, projects here, and that's why we're still holding off on our final design for um, Southern California. Um, typically, we we try to stack as much as possible with programs for the IOU um, CPUC approved ones where they have a if their program has a cap on the number of connectors or chargers they are authorized to install we do not have those or allow those to be stackable um, if their program has a dollar amount and doesn't specify a cap on the connectors then we will allow um, those to be stackable so there are some differences there the level two programs by all the IOUs typically are set with that cap of connectors. Thus, those are not um, stackable with Cali VIP. Um, the other programs, I believe PG&E's fast charger program has a dollar cap. So that one does have stackable um, possibilities, but as well outside of Edison, there are multiple um, POU programs out there that have funding available and those are also stackable um, on designing again we try to do that complement and fill some gaps i know the initial um, pilots for each included uh, minimum connector requirements i believe of 10 or more where they're really aimed for larger sites and kelly vip has always tried to um, fit the fit the other shoe where we're trying to help smaller businesses um, get chargers where you know a solicitation is very difficult for a mom and pops or a single business to apply for and participate with and so our requirements typically have been one to ten connectors um, we can go above um, in some projects but we try to fill the gap that others um, might not be including there was a uh second portion of the question the uh, uh, earlier question about uh the ports uh are the rebates per port or per charger uh the the follow-up question is how does this stretch the available funds for dc fast chargers brian do you want to take that um i'll start and then kick it to andy a little bit but um again it is an active connector um rebate now so again if you have two connectors on a fast charger but only one can be charging a vehicle at a time then that is one rebate for that um, connector if your charger with two connectors can charge two cars thus using both connectors then that's eligible for two rebates ultimately um you know the expanding the funding and chargers um we're viewing it as trying to rebate how many vehicles can really um, be charged at a time so it kind of stays the same because before if a charger could only charge one vehicle um, you know you'd be eligible for four but now if you have two chargers that can simultaneously charge um, on both of them that's still four 
uh, vehicles that can be charged. So um, we're trying to pretty much, it's, again, addressing what's the, what's the public going to be able to do and charge and what charge rates can they do. So um, Andy, I don't know if you have any additional adding there. I don't think so. You summarized it well, Brian. Brian, just maybe one here uh, for funding is if funding is added for future uh, federal or state governments, will the existing waitlist applications be prioritized, or this or uh, will you think of any new application periods being open? So I don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> um, as much as I might portray it sometimes, but um, we, you know, we don't know how that would work. Um, first, you know, any additional funding that ever becomes available has to go through a lengthy process of, um, you know, the energy commission's investment plans, then allocations to units, and then allocations to projects or solicitations, etc. Um, Cali VIP would have to pretty much go through the same process and decide how best to use those funds to serve the public. I think that has captured the majority of the questions. If anyone wants to, to fill any more questions, we can open that up as well. And maybe we give a one last call for a couple of minutes, the last questions. But again, this is just your last call for the webinar. Um, all comments will be due by 5 p.m. on March 19th, um, a week from tomorrow. Um, that's just for us to incorporate items um, immediately in our next couple of projects. The docket, again, is always open. So any questions or comments, suggestions, et cetera, are always um, eligible to uh, be submitted. Um, you know, the closeout um, designing that we're still doing, you know, that's going to be a lengthier process. So um, if you want to take more time on that, but, um, you know, we, we welcome comments at any time through the docket, through the Cali VIP website and um, contact, as well as um, myself, if you would like to reach out. I do have one final question here for DC fast chargers. What is the cap per project? We saw a maximum of six DC fast chargers, but now incentives are on a connector basis. Does previous max change too? So again, everything we're proposing and um, showing as finalized for Inland so far and our other projects, um, all of these changes are for these next four projects only and do not affect existing projects. So Peninsula, Silicon Valley, San Diego, Sonoma, and down that list the opposite direction. Those requirements are not changing. These are only into effect for Inland counties, South Central Coast, Alameda and Southern California level two. Great, and just a reminder that um, the docket will be open until March the 19th at, at 5 p.m. So after this, if there are other questions that um, you want to ask, please um, go to the docket. Any closing comments, Brian? Um, no, I think I'll just say thanks to everybody for participating. Um, this slide deck is on that docket as well. There is an event um, just for this workshop that has the notice, the slide deck. And as CSE mentioned, this was uh, is still recorded and will, um, one, be emailed out to the attendees, but then also be docketed to that event um, page as well. So. If you missed out on anything, you have multiple options here to um, catch up. But again, I just want to thank everybody for your time and thanks CSC for hosting. Great, thank you. And that uh, ends the, uh, the session today. Thank you all.